Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because of the privilege you've given us to study the Bible together. We thank you for your promise in our lives. We thank you because of the place of the word in the life and the heart of every Christian and in the life of the church as a whole. We know that without the study of the word of God, we'll be weak. We'll not be abounding in the work of the Lord. We will not be able to move on in strength and in courage and in the grace of God. But it is a study of your word that strengthens us, encourages us, establishes us in the truth. Therefore, Lord, we pray that the privilege you have given us will never lose it in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that as we come together today in honor of your name, in regard to your word, in obedience to what you have commanded us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We pray, O oh Lord, that the blessings of the word will come upon us in Jesus' name. We pray that you reveal yourself, your salvation, your help, and your mercy, and all that you have for us to reveal unto us as we look into this word in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that the important things you want us to see today, the principles of life from your word, Principles that will keep us in the kingdom of God. We will not miss in Jesus' name. Be with us today. Show us the way. Show us the truth. Enlighten us in the pathway of righteousness. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you that these are times we need to study the Word of God more. You know that this time we are now, it's the rainy season. And you know sometimes, either on Monday or Thursday or even on Sunday, the rain may come unexpectedly. But in as much as we do not allow the rain to stop us from going to our places of work, we do not allow the rain to stop our children from going to school. We do not allow the rain to stop us from going to the market or from cooking our food and taking the, the physical food to strengthen our body. I think if we look at the word of God and we take it more important than the physical natural food, than our places of work, then we're not going to allow the rain to stop or hinder us in any way. So I want to encourage you that you please keep coming. Rain or no rain. Transportation or no transportation. More so that the district church is so very near to you. And we have this privilege of going in depth into the word of God. You see, as we study from Monday to Monday, from week to week, we can rejoice in the Lord. As the Lord, when he saw his own disciples, he rejoiced in his spirit. And he said, Blessed are your eyes for what they see, and your ears for what they hear. Because kings and princes and prophets have desired to look into these things, but they have not been able don't let us play with the great privilege the Lord has given unto us. And as we are here today, I believe that the word of God will enrich your life in Jesus' name. Our present study is in Exodus. And as you know, if you've been coming for some time, we started from Exodus chapter 1 at the beginning of this year. And chapter by chapter, step by step, stage by stage, the Lord has been leading us through. And we have now come to Exodus chapter 12, an important chapter for the children of Israel, an important, essential, indispensable chapter of study for us who are the children of God even today. What we're looking at today, which is a continuation of what we looked at the other time in Exodus chapter 12, grants us the privilege to look more closely into the plan of redemption for lost humanity. Israel's deliverance from Egypt is a picture of our salvation from sin. Israel's exodus or departure from Egypt symbolizes our separation from the world of sin, the world of evil. God's mercy saved and delivered Israel from bondage while his wrath fell on the unrepentant and unbelieving Egyptians. Two things on the one side, mercy. On the other side, judgment. Two things on the one side, the goodness of God. On the other side, the severity of God. 
two things. On the one side, the grace of God. And the, on the other side, you have the damnation, the condemnation, the wrath that fell upon the Egyptians. That is why we're looking at the two sides of God today in what we're going to study, which is God's mercy and judgment. For those who respond to him, mercy. For those who reject him, judgment. For those who come to him, pleading, wanting pardon, he shows mercy. For those who do not come to him and they rebel against his word, against his warning, judgment will come. In fact, if you look at a passage of scripture, which is Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. You see these two things. On the one hand, the goodness of God. On the other hand, the severity of God. Mercy and judgment. Look at that verse. Behold, therefore... The goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. It tells us, if you come, there's mercy, there's pardon, there's forgiveness, there's redemption. There is uh, the grace of God, but he refused to come. There is indignation and there is wrath and there is judgment from the hand of the Lord. Now, you see that in the passage we're looking at today, just like we did last uh, the other time, uh, God sent Moses and Aaron. Look at it in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, and then he continued, he gave the instruction to Moses and Aaron to give to the children of Israel. But I need to uh, discuss some things here with you. You see, God used Moses and Aaron to instruct the children of Israel concerning their deliverance. But I want to reassure you and I want to remind you that the message was not of Moses, it was of God. The means of their deliverance was not originating from Moses, it originated from God. The method of their deliverance did not originate from Moses and Aaron, it originated from God. We learn a great lesson there. The message may come to us through man, through mortal clay, through a messenger. But that message did not originate from that messenger, from that preacher. When you hear the message of salvation, when you hear the message of repentance and faith in Christ, when you hear the message of deliverance from this world of darkness and sin, please understand it is the message of God. Because it did not originate from man, it is exactly from God. The plan of redemption or the way of salvation does not originate from preachers or theologians. If Moses or if Aaron had changed or misinterpreted the message to Israel, what do you think would have happened? Israel would have suffered the death penalty. They would not have been delivered from Egypt. What if Moses did not remember that they were to apply the blood upon the lintels of their houses? What if Moses only said, kill the lamb and leave it like that? What if he did not tell them, remain in the houses where the blood had been sprinkled upon the doorposts? What if he forgot part of the message, neglected part of the message, hid part of the message, and he did not deliver the whole message unto them. Israel would have been judged severely. The death penalty would have come upon them. It's the same thing today. What if preachers change the message? Misinterpret the message? Adulterate the message? What if preachers today, as they preach the message of salvation to sinners, what if they do not give the full message, the whole message, and they modify it or misinterpret it? Do you know what will happen? The sinners will not really be saved. They may think they are saved, but they will not really be saved. The incomplete message of salvation cannot really save. What if today the preachers will water down the message of holiness to Christians? Then the Christians will be deceived and they will miss heaven at last. That's why the Bible tells us, look at it, in Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, reading from verse 21. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the king. Listen to this second part. And meddle not with them that are given to change. You find people that are changing the message of the word of God. That message that will change cannot save anymore. You find people that are modifying the message of righteousness. The message of holiness. That message cannot preserve anymore. 
you find mess you find people that are changing more defined the message of salvation and they will not give the whole beat and the whole deal to the sinners they are preaching to then that message will not be able to save anymore we have a lot of instructions in exodus chapter 12. the instructions in exodus chapter 12 were given carefully to israel and israel carefully carried them out it was a matter of life and death it was serious it was a matter of deliverance and bondage. It was serious. It was a matter of salvation and perdition. It was serious. They believed God and they obeyed Him implicitly. Nothing short of faith with obedience is required today for salvation and security in Christ. This is an important message you cannot miss. And I plead with you, please pay attention. We're going to consider three points. Number one. The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Number two, security under the blood. Very important message, security under the blood. Number three, death of Egypt's firstborn. Death of Egypt's firstborn. Let's go to point one. We're looking at the Passover, which is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Let's open our Bibles together. Exodus chapter 12. We're reading it from verse 14. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation unto you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save except that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. Verse 17, And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this self same day have I brought you, have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. Seven days, you understand that in verse 18, it says from the fourteenth to the twenty-first day. 21 minus 14, what is that? 7. Now verse 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations, shall ye eat unleavened bread we come to verse 24 and ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever and it shall come to pass when ye shall come to the land which the lord will give you according as he has promised that ye shall keep this service and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what may ye by this service that ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. I want you to notice that in these verses, the Lord showed them the way of escape from the judgment of God. The way of escape from the death penalty that was going to come upon all the people in Egypt. Before I look into the verses very closely, I want you to look at something very significant, something very important that we as children of God should take note of. At the end of verse 27, it says, And the people bowed the head and worshipped. They received instruction from the world. 
didn't just receive that instruction and go away without noting everything that was said, without understanding everything that was said, and without even thanking the Lord for it, when they received the word, they bowed the head and they worshipped. Isn't that what we emphasize? That when you hear the word of God, don't just take your Bible and take whatever you have brought your bag and then go back home. You bow the head or you kneel down or you stand up, whichever, and you worship the Lord. They prayed to the Lord. They praised the name of the Lord. They glorified him. They worshipped him because he had developed and he had given unto them the way of salvation. Then in verse 28, the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded. They went away and did it. They didn't just hear it. They were doers of the word. And I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, be not ye just hearers of the word, deluding or deceiving your own self, but be ye doers of the word. They went away. And as they went away, they did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. It emphasizes, verse 28, so did they. May God make every one of us doers of the word in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to realize here that the Lord spoke to them about the Passover. And there are two aspects of the Passover the Lord spoke, spoke unto them. Number one, the present Passover. Number two, the future Passover. Number one, the present Passover. That is what they were to, to do that very night so that the judgment of God will pass over them. Condemnation will pass over them. The angel of death will pass over them so that they will, they will not experience the judgment and the wrath and the indignation of God. So then they were to kill the Passover lamb even that very night. But the Lord did not even stop there. He also told them that from generation to generation, they will keep that Passover. And we thank the Lord for these children of Israel in Exodus chapter 12. They did it, which was a present thing. And as we look at the, at the record of the children of Israel for the future, they were given more instructions in the future. And there were records of future times when they kept the Passover. Now, let's uh, try to do some deep study here. You need to uh, kind of buckle up now and tighten your belt and uh, think through because this may be heavy material for some people. You see, as we have read in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 11, it says, It is the Lord's Passover. This is what the Lord himself had uh, instituted. It is the Lord's Passover. Then in explaining what it means, pass over, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He instituted it, he planned it, he executed it. He said, this is what you do. And when I see the sign of what I told you to do, I will pass over you. And then God said, this day shall be a memorial unto you. Ye shall keep a feast, this feast unto the Lord throughout your generations. I want to zero in, I want to focus on this word, Passover. In the original language, it is Pesach. And this is used in the Old Testament to, to mean spreading the wings over and to protect. In fact, if you look at Isaiah chapter 31 verse 5, it says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of us defend Jerusalem. Defending also will deliver it and pass over. It is that same word but in a modified form because it is a participle of the original word Pesach. It says it will pass over, passing over. It will preserve it. Which tells us the meaning of that word. That actually the original means that God will spread its wings over every house with the mark of the blood. He will cover every house with the mark of the blood. And then when the angel of death came near, when he saw the mark of the blood and the appearance of the presence of God overshadowing and spreading the wings over that house, then the angel of death will pass over. Do you understand that in our own case too, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And Jesus Christ has been sacrificed for us. Jesus Christ actually is the Lord's Passover to you. We've read this before, but let us look at it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. Now this is important, for even Christ our Passover 
even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us can I just remind you of what we have read in Exodus chapter 12 we can say for Exodus chapter 12 for the children of Israel we can say even the blameless lamb even the spotless lamb had been the Passover lamb had been sacrificed for them but ours is a great privilege that ours is not an animal it's not a kid, it's not a goat, it's not a lamb from the sheep, from the herd. But it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you remember that John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ come in the following day? And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you remember Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. They pierced his side and also the crown of thorns upon his head. And the blood coming down. And then as he shed the blood, just before he gave up the ghost, he yielded up himself. He said, it is finished. Now we can rejoice and say, for even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. For them, it was a lamb, an animal. For us, for us, it is Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. If you are born again, I rejoice with you. Because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. His blood has been applied upon our heart. His blood has washed our life clean. His blood has made the mark upon us. It is a token of our redemption. It is a sign that we are under the mark of the blood of redemption. And because of that, our sins are forgiven. We are free from the law of sin and death. And we have complete protection from the judgment of God, from the wrath of God. Because even Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Now, as you look at the Passover, I told you that in that Exodus chapter 12, they were obeying it and they were doing it for the first time. As you look at the children of Israel and you come to the Gospels, there are seven times that we have the record that they kept the Passover. Now, listen to this. This is very important for you as a student of the Bible. It didn't mean that from the time of Exodus chapter 12 until the time of Jesus Christ when he went to die on the cross of Calvary. It doesn't mean they only kept it seven times. No, but seven times are recorded. And you see everything is significant in scripture. And you know that seven is a mark of completeness. Seven is the number for the completeness of or the complete cycle. And it is so important that they kept it seven times recorded in Scripture. Let me just go through with you. You will not be able to read all the references because there are so many. Number one is the time they kept it in Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. The second time they kept it was in the wilderness, Numbers chapter 9. The third time they kept it was when they entered into land, into the land of Canaan, when they got the promised possession. That is Joshua chapter 5. The fourth time was when in the days of Ezekiah. Do you remember Ezekiah, that good king? That king that served the Lord with a perfect heart. In fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, they kept the Passover. The feast time was under the reign of Josiah. That was in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. If you have time, you read that when you get back home. In fact, it tells us that there was no, there was no time. When they kept the Passover in such a wonderful, beautiful manner, that it, like in that case of the reign of Josiah, the sixth time was after the return from captivity, which you find in Ezra chapter 6. And then the seventh time, significant, the seventh time was when it was celebrated by the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles immediately before the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus Christ... The very Lamb of God, prefigured by the preceding Paschal Lambs, he himself celebrated the last and the seventh recorded Passover, just before going to the cross to die for our sins. Very significant for us as children of God, we shall rejoice that God has opened our eyes, that we are not just studying to see that these things were done, but for the very fact that Jesus Christ, our own Passover, is sacrificed for us. But then we need to notice something connected with this Passover. It was connected with the Passover at the time of Exodus. And in all the other, other times they recorded for us that the Passover was kept, it was also part of it, which is the fact that they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
very very important and very essential in fact it was so essential that god put a penalty he said there'll be a penalty for everyone that took leaven many times maybe when we when we mention leaven you don't understand what leaven is those who bake bread they understand if you put yeast into it then it will make it to swell up if you don't put it it will make it not it, it will not swell up at all it will just be like you are eating biscuit but it is when you put the leaven, it is when you put the yeast, that then it will swell up. But they were being told here that they should not put the leaven. They should not put the yeast so that it will just look as if it is biscuit they were eating. I just said it in the language of biscuit so that you will understand what it is saying. Now, they were told that if they ate a uh, leavened bread, then they will be cut off from among the people. Look at it in verse 15. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever, think about this, whosoever, very significant, whosoever eateth leaven, eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that so shall be cut off from Israel. I want you to understand something here. You know, the penalty that was coming upon the Egyptians was the penalty of death. Very significant. Because they had rejected God. They rejected the warnings of God. They rejected the word of God. The penalty that came upon them was death. Do you remember the scripture? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so the children of Israel, they were to escape death. But there were conditions. It wasn't automatic. Was it because I'm a, I'm a descendant of Abraham? No, that wasn't sa what saved them. Was it because they were circumcised? No, that wasn't what saved them. What then saved them? The Lord already told them, number one, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The animal had to be slain. And the blood had to be applied. And by faith, in a sprinkling of the blood, they put the blood upon the lintels of the houses and the side posts, and then they stayed inside the houses. Not only that, while they were staying inside, he said they should not take leavened bread. Pay attention, they should not take leavened bread. And if they did, it said they will be cut off from among the people of God. What does that mean? It means the death penalty will come upon them. Well, we thank God for the children of Israel. They kept away from unleavened, they kept away from leaven. And they ate just unleavened bread. What's the significance for us today? Very essential, very important. We have to go back to the passage we read before in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm now reading from verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb? Put ye out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ has passed over his sacrifice for us. But it is important, therefore. Therefore. What's that therefore? What's it therefore? It says because Christ has passed over. Has been sacrificed for us. And it's reminding us that in the Old Testament, the Passover was always associated. Always associated with the feast of the unleavened bread. Therefore, because Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So then we're told very clearly there that leaven is a symbol of wickedness, of malice, of sin. Unleavened bread is a symbol of sincerity, honesty, obedience, truth, sound doctrine, loyalty unto God. It says, as Christ has been sacrificed for us our Passover, we have a responsibility that all through the rest of our lives we should not have anything to do with leaven which is sin. We should not have anything to do with malice or wickedness or iniquity or evil. We should be separated from leaven. Let me remind you that the children of Israel were to separate themselves from leaven seven days. And you want to remember that seven is a symbol. Seven days here is a symbol of a complete cycle of time. It is telling us that in our conduct, in our life as a Christian and also as a church, 
corporate body together, we are not to have sin. All through the course of our time, collectively as a church, individually as a believer, we ought to walk in practical holiness. During the entire period of our course here on earth, this is the direct result of being washed in Christ's blood and being indwelt by Christ himself. Now I've read it to you when it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Leaven is a symbol of evil. That kind of evil, evil that spreads and corrupts everything with which it comes, it comes into contact. To eat unleavened bread signifies separation from all evil. In acknowledgement of our communion with Christ. And this is to last throughout the whole sojourn. The whole of our sojourn on earth. Much more is included in this figure of speech when it says leaven. It is much more than the grosser works of the flesh. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6. And let Christ himself tell us about the leaven. And let him tell us and show us what we are to avoid. What we are to forsake. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of Pharisees and of the leaven of Sadducees. There's one thing there, the leaven of Pharisees. There's a second thing there, the leaven of the Sadducees. What can we say concerning the leaven of the Pharisees? It means hypocrisy. It means the traditions of men. It means religious pride. It means formalism. It means resting on external religion without inward grace. All that you will find as the characteristics of the Pharisees. In fact, that is the reason why Jesus Christ pronounced woe and judgment and curse upon the Pharisees because of the living of hypocrisy. And it is telling us that if we have had Christ dying for us and we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, let us purge out the leaven of the Pharisees. Let hypocrisy be purged out of your life. Spiritual pride, religious pride, purged out of your life. Formalism. What is formalism? Those are the people that inform, they profess, they know God, but they deny the power of godliness. Let all that shallow, superficial, hypocritical, deluding, pretending kind of external religion get out of our lives. Let us possess inward grace. Then in that Matthew chapter 16 verse 6, it says, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and now of the Sadducees. There is the leaven of the Sadducees. What is that? The Sadducees were told, we have no time to read all the references because of her time, were told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 23, they did not believe in the supernatural. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the angels. Now do you see the leaven of the Sadducees is materialism. You see those Sadducees, all they were concerned about with what I see, what I taste, what I handle. Their principle of life is, let us eat because tomorrow we shall die. Because they did not believe in the supernatural. All they depended upon was the modern thought of, you need to care for yourself now. All that's important is the physical, your physical beauty, your physical life, your physical possession. Jesus Christ said, beware of that. Beware of that kind of modern thought. Beware of that kind of uh, materialism. Beware of rejecting the supernatural. You see, there are some people that will say they are Christians. They have mental knowledge of, of Christianity. They don't know how to pray. They do not depend upon the supernatural in, in, in making sure that they have what they ought to have from the Lord. In fact, they reject the supernatural and the truth of the resurrection. Beware and avoid and purge out the leaven of the Sadducees. But then as we look at the words of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 15. Here is something important that Jesus also mentioned. He said, and he charged them, saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, who have come across that before, and of the leaven of Herod. Here is another thing, and you see this is different, it's not just another repetition. The leaven of Pharisees, we know that now. 
the leaven of the Sadducees, we know that now. How about the leaven of Herod? What does that mean? You remember that John the Baptist warned and exhorted Herod. He said, it is not right for you to take the wife of Philip, your brother. What's the leaven of uh, Herod? That is the leaven of polygamy. That is the leaven of snatching somebody else's wife. That is the leaven of marrying somebody who had married before. He says you must avoid and you must purge out that leaven away from your life. What other things do we learn about Herod? You remember it was Herod that had birthday. day? You remember it was Herod that called the drummers and the dancers and, Herod, and the daughter of Herodias. And she danced and pleased him so well. And then he promised a lot and said, even to the half of my kingdom, I will give unto thee. What was the Lord telling us? The Lord is telling us, beware of the leaven of worldliness. Because, you see, that is the leaven of Herod. You see, there are people, they say they are Christians, but they have not seen the inside of the kingdom of God. They say they are Christians, but they have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the categories of so-called Christians that will be having birthday parties and the funeral ceremonies that will block the roads and the beating drum and be dancing and having all these works of the flesh. You, if you say you are a Christian, beware of the leaven of Herod, because that is worldliness. Friendship of the world is enmity with God. All these things must be excluded rigidly from our lives. Carelessness of work, evil association, worldliness and fleshly indulgences and sin in all its forms must be totally eradicated and purged out and taken away from all our lives. In fact, in the words of Jesus Christ, it says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Because the seed of God, the nature of God abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Therefore you need to take heed to the word of God. Because whosoever takes leaven, whosoever brings back into his life the leaven of hypocrisy, of spiritual pride, of formalism, of external religion without inward grace, or the leaven of materialism, or the leaven of not believing the supernatural, the leaven of false doctrine. If you bring into your life the leaven of worldliness, of all these throwing parties here and throwing parties there, of friendship with the world, of polygamy and snatching other people's wives, then it says that soul shall be cut off from among the people of God. Let's now go to point two. Point 2 tells us on the security under the blood. Security under the blood. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12. And I'm looking at it from verse 21 to verse 23. Verse 21 to verse 23 of Exodus chapter 12. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families. And kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of Esau. And dip it in the blood. That is in the basin. And strike the lintel. And the two side posts with the blood. That is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. That's so important. I need to read that part of verse 22 to you. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. That was a condition of the security. They had applied the blood. They even had been keeping inside the house to eat unleavened bread. They were feeding on the lamb. But then it says, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Here we learn of uh, the provision of the Lord. The Lord told them, apply the blood and stay within that house that is marked with the blood of the Lamb. Very important. Apply the blood and stay inside that house that is marked with the blood of the lamb that was their security they were to say instead as we have already learned in our last study um, of exodus chapter 12 this exodus chapter 12 typifies our redemption by faith in the blood of the lamb of god god in his grace 
plan for our salvation and offered Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, as the final, the perfect, the acceptable sacrifice, Israel had to believe. Israel had to obey the instructions given by God through Moses for their deliverance. The innocent lamb was to die as their substitute. The blood of the lamb was to be applied on the lintel and the two side posts of the door of each house and each Israelite was to remain within the house for security. This is very similar to uh, many passages of scripture that tells us concerning our security. Let me just read to you uh, some passages of scripture bearing on the fact that you need to remain under the mark of the blood. You have been born again. You have been saved. We praise the Lord. But that is not enough. You must abide. Abide in Christ. Abide in the word of God. And now we're going to look at some other passages. Look with me in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 12. If I can remind you of this story. Rahab had received the two spies that came from the children of Israel. And then she pleaded with them. She said, I know the Lord has delivered the land unto you. But what token, what sign are you going to give unto me so that I will be saved? I will be secured? I will escape the judgment that the judgment and the wrath of God and the destruction coming upon Jericho will not fall upon me. And now the same condition we read about in Exodus chapter 12. Apply the blood. Not only that, stay within the house for your security. This is what we're going to read about now in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 12. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and will give me a true token, that means a true sign. In verse 18, behold, when we come into the land, Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread. Uh, before I go on, that scarlet thread, uh, that is a red, which is the color of blood. It says, you will bind this scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father, and thy mother, and thy brethren, and all thy father's household, Home unto thee. Do you see that condition there? You bring them home unto thee. They must stay inside, indoors, under the mark of that scarlet thread. If they are going to be secured, if they are going to escape the judgment. Verse 19. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. You see the condition of security there? The condition of security is stay inside the marked house. Stay inside the marked house. And now if you look at other passages, the same thing you will find in First Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. And I'm reading to you from verse 36. Let me just tell you the background of the story here. Shimei had offended in the days of Moses. And it was a grievous offense. He cursed the king. He abused the king. He threw stones at the king. He threw dust at the king, King David. And then Joab said, when King David eventually came back safely, he said that this a man should be killed. But he said, no, what have I got to do, ye sons, uh, to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? Will he be put to death today, seeing that the Lord has delivered me and has restored the kingdom unto David? So Shimei did not die. But then, just before David died, then he gave Solomon instruction. And Solomon was now going to give instruction to Shimei. Telling Shimea the condition of security. The condition of security. That's what I want you to look at here in verse 36. 1 Kings chapter 2. And the king sent and called for Shimea. And said unto him, Build thee an house in Jerusalem. And dwell there. And go not forth thence any whither. For it shall be that on the day thou goest out, and passest over the book Kydron. Thou shalt know for certainty that thou shalt surely die, and thy blood shall be upon thine own head. 
And so in this passage, we have seen also the condition. Shimea, your life can be preserved. Shimea, you can overcome, you can escape death, but on one condition, build in Jerusalem and stay in Jerusalem, the city of the king. And this is what the Lord is telling us. Stay in the, in the kingdom, stay with the king and stay with the Lord. If you remain with the Lord, abide in Christ and let the word of God of Christ abide in you. There will be security for you. But in the case of Shimei, there was, uh, you know, it so happened that his uh, servants uh, ran off and he went abroad and he went beyond the book, brook Crydon. And eventually he was told about it. What did he do? He ran after them and went outside Jerusalem and went beyond the book Crydon. Because of that, eventually he was killed. He died. For your security, you need to stay under the mark of the blood of the Lamb. It is an interesting story in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, and it points out something very important, very significant unto us. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, verse 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, or and but of the sheep. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given thee all them that stay sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. Here the people were promised salvation in a physical sense. And they were promised also safety. But eventually when the ship was going to land. And then the ship came together. Uh, the, the, the storm came against the ship. What we discover is that it became broken. And they were going to lose some things. So some of the sailors wanted to escape. Look at now verse 30 and 31. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. When they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, that is under pretense, as though they would have cast anchors out of the four sheep. Look at what Paul said in verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the sheep, ye cannot be saved. You see, I told them before, the angel appeared to me. Be of good cheer. He has given me a wonderful promise. There shall be no loss of anyone's life. That was security. That was a promise of God. But then there is condition attached to it. As the shipmen were just to flee away. He said, except these abide in the ship. Except these abide in the ship. Ye cannot be saved. You see, there are some people that will think and they will say, God has promised us eternal security. God has told us that we are eternally secured. They do not look at the condition of the security of the believer. This condition is that we will remain in Christ. Abide in Christ. You see, as you look at all these passages I've read to you, it shows us very clearly committing your soul and the eternal interests of your soul into the hand of the Lord is by no means releasing you from the obligation to abide in Christ and abide in His word. God's promise of security is not designed to encourage sin or licentiousness. God's promises are not made to those who are made to those, made to those, only those who honestly strive against sin, not to those who delight in sin. God undertakes to protect and preserve us on one condition, if, if, if we live in holiness, not if we live in wickedness. Listening to this principle that comes out of the word of God. Divine preservation works through Christian perseverance. Christian perseverance means that you keep on with the Lord. You remain with the Lord. You endure hardness. You endure affliction. You overcome temptation. Christian perseverance. That is the cord that pulls Christ, uh, the divine preservation. Divine preservation that you will not perish. That you are secured in Christ. That you remain in the kingdom of God. That divine preservation works through Christian perseverance. The Christian must fear and hate sin. He must desire and live in holiness. He must heed God's warning and shun the things that defile. He must overcome temptations and obey God's commandments. If he expects God to fulfill his promises and take him to glory eventually. Uh, have you seen what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13? 
Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. Take heed therefore brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. If it were not possible to depart from the living God after you had been saved, how will the Bible say that in scripture? If it were not possible that you will on your own, of your own volition, of your free will, walk away from Christ, walk away from the word of God, why will the gospel tell why will the Bible tell us this? Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You see what God did for the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, where we're studying. It's a covenant. And you want to understand that what we have also in the gospel is a covenant. For in it, God offers and promises security. He offers and he promises escape from judgment upon our acceptance of his offer. And upon our compliance with his terms, with his conditions for Israel. The terms and the conditions of security were clearly stated. To be preserved from judgment and death, each Israelite must be inside a blood-sprinkled house, separated from the wicked, separated from the outsiders, separated from the Egyptians. God told them, mark the house with blood upon the lintels and the doorposts, and then stay inside the house. That was the condition. If they forsook that shelter, and they mingled with the Egyptians outside, they would perish. Typ typically, that is teaching us important lessons. This teaches the imperative necessity of separation from this evil present world, present evil world, so that we'll be able to escape, escape the judgment of God, the impending doom coming upon the world. If we do not, if we do not separate ourselves, from the evil world, then we cannot escape eternal punishment with the world. Except Christians maintain separation from this evil world, then they cannot escape eternal punishment with the world. Let's now go to the last point, which is death of Egypt's firstborn. The death of Egypt's firstborn. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12, and we're looking at it from verses 29 and 30. Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. You see, universal punishment, death came upon them. I want to remind you that God had warned these people before. In fact, the very first message which the Lord commanded Moses to deliver to Egypt's ruler, that is to Pharaoh, is this. Thus says the Lord, Egypt, uh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou wilt refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. That's in Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. And it is evident from what followed. Do you know, you remember what Pharaoh said, who is that God? That I will allow that or I will let Israel go. It is evident from what followed that Pharaoh did not obey this message. And because of that, the judgment eventually fell. That's what I've read to you in verses 29 and 30. See the patience of God. See the long suffering of God. He had said it before. And many things happened, plagues of lesser intensity and plagues of lesser, of, lesser, of lesser evil came upon them. But then eventually because they continued in their stubbornness, they continued in their rebellion, they continued uh, flying uh, against the way of God, against the will of God. Eventually the punishment came that the firstborn of all Egyptians died. Let's look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78 and in verse 49, He cast upon them the fierceness of His anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Verse 51, And He smote all the firstborn in Egypt, 
the chief of their strength in the tabernacles of harm in Psalm 105 Psalm 105 verse 36 he smote also all the firstborn in their land the chief of all their strength so you will see the judgment eventually came upon them but you see we need to rem remember this that the Pharaoh and the Egyptians actually represented the men of this world the solemn word from Christ has gone forth except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish and Jesus also said he that believeth not shall be damned this word has gone forth but for the most part the divine warning has fallen on deaf ears the vast majority of people have not believed have not obeyed what God has said they do not believe that God means what he says nevertheless the word of God who cannot lie will be fulfilled Pharaoh and Egypt discovered days when it was too late to repent to believe and to obey when the threatened judgment from heaven fell upon them neither their wealth nor their poverty could provide exemption for anyone the bible says there was not a house where there was not one dead this is a solemn proof to every sinner today that unless he truly repents divine wrath will soon smite him as we conclude uh, the study of today let us look at romans chapter 6 and verse 23 romans chapter 6 verse 23 already i showed you at the beginning of the study that on the one hand there is mercy for those who repent for those who believe on the other hand there is judgment for those who rebel for those who disobey and here we are told the same thing in this romans chapter 6 and verse 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the case of the Egyptians, death. And for the case of the Israelites, life. Because the Egyptians rebelled and disobeyed, death. And because the Israelites obeyed and they believed the Lord. And they did all that the Lord told them to do, life. It is the same today. The wages of sin is death. If you continue in sin. If you rebel against the Lord, if you do not take, take the way of escape, if you see the way of salvation, you neglect the way of salvation, there will be death. For the wages of sin is death. But then it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you know that the Passover has been slain for you, Christ has died for you, he has shed his blood on your behalf, and now by faith you apply that blood upon your heart, upon your soul upon yourself so that the blood of the lamb will deliver you from the judgment of god you'll pass from condemnation unto justification you'll pass from damnation unto life you will you will escape the judgment of god the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord mercy is available for those who reject that mercy will have to eventually face the judgment of god why don't you come today why don't you put your trust in Christ today? And if you have been born again, do you see the condition of your security? Abide in Christ. Abide in the word of God. Continue to obey the word of God. Therein lies your security. Come to Christ. That's your salvation. Abide in Christ. That's your security. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and let us take this to the Lord in prayer. Thanking the Lord because he has shown us the way of escape from sin and from the judgment and from the penalty of sin from death that comes as the, as the wages of sin. He has shown us we can escape that. He has shown us we can receive eternal life. He has shown us we can have security in Christ. Come to Christ in repentance and faith. That is for your salvation. Abide in Christ. Abide in the word of God. Abide in sound doctrine. That is for, for your security. Don't go home yet. Call upon the name of the Lord. Pray unto the Lord until you pray to your satisfaction. You know that actually all the points and all the principles we have got from this study of today, you have taken it to the Lord in prayer and it is written on the tables of your heart. Pray on and pray through before you go today. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.